Welcome to Seniority Authority, the podcast where I track down experts to answer your questions on aging. I'm your host, Kathleen Toomey. Let's get smarter about growing older. Tell me if this sounds appealing to you. Live a long, healthy life, full of purpose and meaning. Then have a short death. Sound good? I mean, we are all going to die, and probably 100% of us would prefer we spend more time living and less time dying. That was a pretty revolutionary idea back in 2014 with done when Dr. Roger Landry published his landmark book, Live Long, Die Short, a guide to authentic health and successful aging, which is used as a guide today on how to achieve and maintain healthy longevity. A graduate of Tufts and Harvard Universities, decorated military veteran, and preventive medicine physician, Dr. Landry is now president of Masterpiece, a group of multidiscipline specialists who create wellness programming to foster healthy aging. And he hosts his own podcast, Dr. Roger and Friends, The Bright Side of Longevity. Thanks to our show sponsor, The Riverwoods Group, Northern New England's largest family of nonprofit retirement communities, where active adults find community, purpose, and peace of mind. Visit riverwoodsgroup.org. Now let's hear from today's guest. Thank you so much for joining Seniority Authority, Dr. Landry. Kathleen, I consider it an honor. Thank you for having me. Well, you have such an incredible life experience and your career really reflects how people are living today, which is multi-career, multi-opportunities. You know, you were in the military, a decorated veteran, and then worked for a large healthcare concern. And now you're president of a whole new initiative. Uh, You're you're a great advocate for your own work and book. Well, I guess we have to be, right? And if you had asked me when I was in college what I was going to do, it would have been a totally different story. So maybe I didn't have a plan and I just went with the wind, but the wind carried me in very, very excellent places. And uh, I I, uh, I couldn't be happier and I consider myself fortunate, but I agree with you. I, I think uh, as we go through life, we may have a plan, but I think we have to be open to uh, to other opportunities, have a mindset that's a growth mindset, and uh, because uh, there uh, can be some good things out there. And I love hearing you say that because I I think what a lot of us as we get older, um, we start letting fear creep into our decisions, and especially fear of change, uh, which we should get comfortable with change because there's no escaping it. That's the only constant change <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, that was said, I think, by a Greek a long time ago. And uh, yes, it can be very upsetting. Uh, but, uh, you know, that uh, if you don't accept that everything is going to change and you try to hold on to things, uh, I think the Buddhists say this very well. That's the source of a lot of uh, unhappiness and uh, sadness and as well as fear. And so. Uh, it can be difficult, but I, I think we just, you know, life's going to throw it at us, throw curveballs and everything. And I think we just have to stay in the batter's box and hit them out of the park, you know? Exactly. And I loved when I, I of course, I'm a huge fan of your book, read it ages ago, um, have it underlined uh, and tabbed. And um, I really recommend that everyone get a copy of this. And there is a link to it in our show notes. Um, but thank you. One thing that I think is, is interesting is you're writing it from a physician's standpoint. And as we know, many people shortchange older adults, even physicians, we lower our expectations of what healthy aging can look like. And you actually had this experience with a pretty famous person um, long before you wrote the book. Um, can you tell us about your ex- your experience when you were chief flight surgeon for the Air Force? 
Ah, uh, yes. Uh, I I learned at the feet of mentors, like many of us do. But like most most of us, I was uh, I was affected by the the culture around us that marginalized older adults. Uh, we we all have been, and maybe it uh, wasn't malevolent or anything, but you know, I just uh, sort of felt uh, that they were on the margins of society, and uh, I was. Uh, challenged by that some time uh, some time ago, as you mentioned, I was uh, I was at Edwards Air Force Base where the, the flight test school is and test pilots, and uh, I had the famous Chuck Yeager walk into my office. He was retired, but he was flying for uh, defense contractors, and so he needed a physical. So I mean, there there's this god in my uh, in my office, and after the physical, which was very fine, he. Uh, he just sat there and started sharing stories of his life, which, as you know, wow, quite remarkable. And I was all ears. And uh, at one point, he got a little quiet. And then he said, you know, Doc, he says, I think on the 50th anniversary of breaking the sound barrier, I'm going to do it again. Well, I'm not proud of this, Kathleen, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I thought I knew everything when I was in my 30s. And I said, but Chuck, you'll be 73 years old then. And he looked at me, those laser eyes, and said, what's your point? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, 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 I love it. No, and, and what was my point? It was a number that was determining how I thought this person would be. And uh, that has, unfortunately, is how our society, unfortunately, still does things, although it's changing. And uh, that's crazy. You, you know that he did do it on the 50th, the 55th, the 60th, and the 65th anniversary. We know John Glenn went into space. We know that, you know, people start uh, careers writing and, uh, you know, Grandma Moses started painting at 79. And, you know, and, and so uh, we I learned a lesson that I have never forgotten. And now that I'm there, um, uh, I'm happy to see that things are changing a bit, but we still have a way to go. I, I just, I love that story because it shows, it illustrates our assumptions and how our assumptions can be so limiting. And what I find happens with people is when they start internalizing the external assumptions of I'm too old, I can't do that. I, I yes. have a pet peeve against people who are like, yeah, I, um, I, you know, ran a 5K, but I used to run marathons where I used to do this. Don't look back. Look forward. And don't limit yourself. Uh, unfortunately, the biggest reserve of ageism in our society is in older adults themselves. And uh, because they've just grown up in a world where the expectations were low after a certain age, you know, and and uh, they don't have to be, you know, we uh, we can do marvelous things and uh um, uh, I, I look forward to that in my life and I like seeing it in the lives of those I work with. Sure. We're, we're revolutionaries. I mean, my parents never expected to live this long. They wanted to outlive their parents who died in their fifties, early sixties. So there was no roadmap for, for a living. And now we are writing that we are that generation that is saying, yeah, no, we got more to do. And, and thanks to yourselves, thanks for physicians. We've got new knees, new hips, you know, those sky's the limit. That's, that's right. Uh, the word uh, in Saddle Me is a cadre of people like yourself and others, thankfully, uh, uh, who are talking about healthy longevity. So mm -hmm. we, we have the longevity benefit. But that doesn't guarantee that that's a healthy one. And it could be just 10 or 20, 15, 20 or more years of pain, suffering and increased health care costs unless we pay attention. And it doesn't take a lot. You know that it really doesn't. And uh, that we can have a healthy longevity. And and uh, you were a real pioneer in 2014 to put the word die on the cover of a book that you're <laughs> trying to sell. Um, <laughs> My publisher was uh, very upset about that. I said, I'm, I'm sure. It's important. It's important that I do this. I said, I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm sure that was a battle. Uh, but <laughs> who doesn't want to die short? And and I think that's that's been a focus of your work when when you retired from the military and then you had a stint in working for large health care organizations. And then you said, you know, there is more for me to do and it's not here. You started a group called the Healthy Aging Work 
group. And what was what were you trying to figure out at that time? Well, more information had come out about what it takes to age in a better way. Uh, it was a, a significant study. And uh, what we wanted to do, it, it, it was just information. But what we wanted to do is to apply it. How can we apply the information that this study and other studies since have all validated that it was lifestyle that was the major determinant? How can we apply this in a way? How could we put tools in the hands of older adults and those who work with older adults to uh, to make sure that this is the more likely outcome, that they have a healthy longevity, that they they do live a long life of high function and that their 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 end is not a long protracted decade long pain and suffering and expense as we uh, as we said and uh, so that was our goal how how do we apply this knowledge in a way that it's practical and doable and uh, and results in more people attaining a healthy longevity i i think that's phenomenal and um just referring to some of those findings the macarthur study the 70% of the physical difference and 50% of the intellectual difference in the quality of successful aging is due to lifestyle. Uh, that, that bears repeating because it's not fatalistic. It's not, it is what it is, which is one of my most hated expressions. It is saying you can have a significant impact on the on the quality of your own life. Absolutely. And, you know, this came out and the, the book uh, came out in the early 90s. What a what a stereotype type smashing phenomenon it was, because that's not what we believe. We believe there was genes or luck or serendipity. And this one said how you age is mostly dependent upon you and the choices that you make every day. You know, how much you move, how much you stay connected, how much you continue to use your brain and learn, and how much you have meaning and purpose in your life. Those are the things that really matter the most. And uh, to the extent that you paid attention to that, you you can, and we, you absolutely can. And again, the subsequent research has all validated that, that this is mostly up to us. We can't blame our parents or blame the world. And certainly things happen, as we said. Life will throw you curveballs, but it's a, the ability to accommodate that and how you have built up resilience that allows you to uh, to take that. We, we just learned about resilience with this uh, pandemic. You know, we all in some way or another had to come up with some resilience in order to get through it. And uh, and that that is the story of healthy longevity. It's about paying attention to your lifestyle, making choices that are easy to make that, you know, you don't have to run marathons and just eat tree bark. You know, you can really enjoy life and, uh, and, uh, and have that result in a longer time of high function. And this is what I know my audience is so interested in is what can I do now to improve the quality of my life? Um, one thing I, I just want to, and I want to dive into that, but one thing I want to just point out, which I think is important in your, in your book, you refer to authentic aging. What do you mean by authentic aging for our listeners? Well, as I was writing this book, it wasn't my intent initially, but as I was writing, it became, uh, uh, some things sounded remarkably familiar to me. And then, and, and I look back and I, where is that from? And it was from a, a course on anthropology that I took in college and, uh, uh, evolutionary anthropology. And, and, uh, and, and when you began to think about it for about 99% of the time we have been on earth, we were hunter gatherers. You know, and that's hard to wrap your head around, but 99% of the time humans have walked the earth, they were hunter gatherers. That, that feels like a long time. <laughs> a long time. And that lifestyle, uh, because they lived it, we were able to survive, uh, because it was a, it was a tough neighborhood. The world. Yeah. <laughs> and the humans, I would not have, ex I would not have existed. I can't see, uh, I have very poor vision, so I would be stomped on by a dinosaur. I know that. So I'm yeah, happy. Sure. happy I'm born when I was. 
And so if we banded together the way we did, we're social creatures, we had to do that. That was the, one of the major things we did. And we did have a superior intellect and we could use tools and all of those things. But still, we wouldn't have done it alone. But the lifestyle that they adopted and this lifestyle is deeply embedded in our DNA for our health, happiness, and the and the ability to survive in in a in a tough world, be resilient, and um, and we have, you know, sometime around the industrial revolution, we we changed how we looked at older adults, and uh, we have uh, as this ageism and this marginalization has put us in a situation, and and actually all of us living lives that are quite different than our ancestors. You know, that's that's life. That's the world advancing. This is high tech world and all that. But uh, to the extent that we get away from these core values, these core lifestyle, when when we reincorporate them into our life or keep them in our life, movement, social connection, you know, continuing to use our brain and having meaning and purpose when we have those things. We have health that is authentic to who we are as humans. Um, you know, we're struggling now because the world is changing so rapidly. And uh, we're, we're paying less attention to some things that are fundamental to our health and welfare and our longevity, our healthy longevity. And uh, it's, uh, that's understandable. And I don't want everyone to go back to being a hunter-gatherer. But it's, uh, it's important that we look at those very, very basic qualities that allowed us to survive as humans and continue to be a need in order to age in a better way. And that's why I call them authentic because they're deeply embedded in our DNA. This is, this is so important because it is not an external set of principles that are foreign to us, but it is something that really harkens back to how we were constructed, how we were created as human beings. And this is wonderful intellectual conversation. But what I particularly love about your book is that it gives very practical recommendations. So in the book, which my readers will, my listeners will uh, love reading, there is an actual healthy lifestyle inventory, which anyone can take. So you have a sense of where are you on the spectrum of living healthy, living a more authentic life, as Dr. Landry just explained it. And uh, do you have even any sense of how many people, how many thousands of people have taken this inventory? I mean, since the book was published, it has to be thousands. I, I get calls all the time. I got a 90%. I get a <laughs> and uh no, uh, if we're going to change, you know, we usually sort of uh, actually we're, we're actually pretty hard on ourselves, most of us, about how our lifestyle is and what we think needs changing. And the New Year's resolution comes from that. And what happens? You know, we fail. Almost everyone fails or forgets about a New Year's resolution by February. We try to do too much too soon. And we'll, we can talk about that, how. Uh, whatever we do to change, we should do in small steps. It's a Japanese approach called Kaizen. And, uh, and it's the way to success and durable change that lasts. But we, we do these grandiose things. And, and really, as I said, these are just uh, basic things. And before you can make any substantive change, you should have an objective look at, at your lifestyle and, I don't know if we can be objective about our own lifestyle. And so the questions, they're just 12 quick questions, uh, were designed to help someone to, uh, to, to take an objective look at their lifestyle and then uh, decide where, what areas they want to pay attention to. Uh, we have a more sophisticated one uh, that we use with our partner uh partner senior living communities, uh, but we have altered that. So uh, pretty soon uh, there's one that's going to be available uh, over the internet, uh, which which then can guide someone on what areas, physical, intellectual, social, meaning and purpose, what areas uh, need a little work, and uh, also take into consideration how uh, an individual navigates the world, how they look at the world, their, their personal mindset and their personal views and uh, incorporate that all in to guide them through 
change, uh, lifestyle change. But anyone can do that. I mean, I think uh, these 12 questions that are in the book can help uh, or if uh, or something similar that's out there. Get a little a bit of an objective viewpoint and then take small steps uh, to improve your lifestyle. Holistic lifestyle, not just physical. It's the intellectual, social, and uh, spiritual, we can call it, or peace and fulfillment. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that I love is is very, very holistic. It's not a diet. It's it's changing your life and how you live your life, not a temporary thing. And who doesn't love to learn more about themselves? We all find ourselves personally fascinating. And so <laughs> who doesn't want to take a quiz to learn how you score? Uh, so it's really, really fun to do. Um, and it gives you a, a way to, for you personally, because every one of us is different. Where do I, where do I focus? And then in the book, also really practical are 10 tips to here are the things that you want to aspire to, to live a long, happy and healthy life. And you can decide, as you say, where to start the small steps. Where is that kaitsu coming in? What area is, is most important to change? Uh, yes, and I wanted it to be. Uh, I wanted. It, I, 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 my my goal was to not be sophisticated or not to be uh, technical or use esoteric terms. My goal was to to reach those people who have tried and given up, or who haven't been doing very much lately, or you know, which is the majority of our population. Certainly, those who are out there, you know, running ten k's and want to run marathons, you know they're going to do it. They're they're sort of already on their own or other things. Sometimes, though, they're not paying attention to other aspects of their life. But I, I wanted to reach uh, that audience uh, who may be couch potatoes a bit uh, or given up on learning and or uh, not paying attention to their social connections, which are diminishing as they age or have uh, determined that their purpose is over in life have with their kids grown and they're now they're retired and uh, not a good not a good way, pro way approach we need purpose in order to be fulfilled so those those 10 tips were you know they were meant to keep people moving keep people learning uh, have them stay connected uh, to uh, assess their risks and where their risks are and uh, and uh, now, I don't want to eliminate risk. You know, sometimes our loved ones uh, yeah, don't give all their parents and grandparents the dignity of taking risk. And, you know, there's risk in life everywhere. And and uh, if you're going to continue to grow, there's some risks there. You know, I don't. they don't have to be life-threatening and they should be done carefully. Like if you're going to skydive, you know, skydive with, you know, in tandem with someone who, who knows how to do it. But if it's important to you, do it. You know, and, you know, but if you're full of you're, full, you're osteoporotic and, and can hardly move, that's probably not a good idea. But, you know, uh, life is risk and growing to, is some risks. And uh, so I wanted that. And I wanted to make sure that people stayed in a generationally connected and that most really importantly, that they be mindful and present for their life. Mm. I mean, so much of us are just chasing our loop, our chattering mind. And uh, and to take life with a sense of humor. The ten tips cover those are the major uh, topics that they cover, and uh, it's not hard, and uh, it's not difficult at all. And uh, and I just wanted to remind people that uh, this is this is being a full human being, being holistic, and it's the way to a healthy longevity. I'm telling you, it's it's so well written. It's so accessible. There's so many stories in there that it is not this dreaded thing that you have to plow through. You can take the quiz, read the chapters that you feel were your weakest. And I think it's a message of inspiration and excitement that we are here. Let's celebrate the fact that we're here and let's see what else we can do. We're not done yet. And that is just just read this book and you will feel better about and, and I'm not saying I'm not being a Pollyanna. I you know, you we are getting older. We are dealing with aches and pains. 
and diseases that are going to be with us for the rest of our lives. But let's not let age define us. Let's not let limitations define us. Well, Kathleen, thanks for the kind words and and your message, as you just said, is spot on. Uh, Yes, we're going to have to accommodate things. You know, things are going to break down and we're going to get diseases that but with modern technology and uh, and make sure that we uh, take advantage of that and that we pay attention to everything that we can accommodate things so that. Yeah, you know, well, uh, I had a story. I uh, I had broken my leg badly in in college, and that was a story unto itself. But I thought it was fixed, and for forty years, it worked pretty well. I was in the military as an athlete, uh, but then uh, it became clear that it wasn't quite right, and things were not going well. And I had really uh, worn away my knee and and ankle, so I had the knee fixed pretty easily these days. You know, you can't yeah. but the ankle, no. And so I was really circling the drain because I. Uh, you know, I I was disappointed. I was crushed that I wasn't the person I thought I was, and I couldn't do things physically. And I, and when I tried to, it I could do less because I hadn't been doing it, and I wasn't using going on the road and giving talks. And if I did, I couldn't find the right word. And I was really circling the drain. And uh, but you know, I kept looking, and finally found a surgeon who was re- uh, replacing ankles and had that done. And geez, then everything went in the opposite direction. You know. Uh, but, you know, had I been my grandfather, it would have been a, a, a really just circling the drain and uh, that would be the end. So it's a, it's accommodating things, using what's available out there to accommodate uh, or, uh, or just saying, OK, I can't do that the way I did before, but I can do this. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, that can that can get us through. Yeah, I did not. I did not realize they had ankle replacement surgery. I bet that is really complicated. It's really marvelous. You know, they don't do brains yet, but they're doing a lot. <laughs> I think the brain is the last frontier. I think it's like space. I, I, there's so it much is. more we have to learn. What we are learning is fabulous, and it's just touching the surface. Absolutely right, Kathleen. If you're getting smarter, help us reach more minds. Leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends to follow us on social or subscribe to our newsletter at senioritiauthority.org. This whole thing of neoplasticity, you know, this this lifelong ability to rewire your brain, you know, lifelong. And so that has changed everything. I mean, we used to think dementia was just inevitable. Right. And uh, we know now that lifestyle can, uh, there was a study with nuns and and these nuns lived a long time and were healthy and led good lives. And when they died, some of them had Alzheimer brains, but they had no symptoms. And so the lifestyle uh, was able to prolong the uh, onset of symptoms. And for them, they died before the symptoms ever got there. Uh, it's amazing stuff. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the ability of our lifestyle to put bad genes to sleep. In other words, we may be cursed with a bad gene that is usually associated with the disease. And our lifestyle, in some cases, can can uh, make uh, determine that that gene never uh, actually uh, activates, never uh, really causes that disease. So it's incredible stuff we can do. It's it's incredible. Even increasing the length of our telemeters. Is it the telomeres? telomeres yeah. Telomeres that, yeah. that that we can, as you were saying, we can rewire our brains if we do the active, if we do this, if we focus on this, if we put some energy into it. And why wouldn't we, as opposed to turning on another Netflix show? Not that Netflix is bad and it's, you know, winter's coming. It's good, but there is more there to life if you choose to embrace it. Yeah. It isn't just, oh, let's be healthy and do exercise. This is about powerful influence on everything. And and I don't even use the E word exercise. I use movement. Just Mm. this is what our ancestors did, you know. Hunter gatherers, they still some villages uh, with our hunt, live a hunter gatherer life, and they take twenty three thousand steps a day. You know, we don't have to do that much, but movement is critical, and it doesn't have to be marathons and and treadmills. That's all right; you can do them if you want, but that's not necessary. If if that's going to put you off, so you don't move, that's bad. But 
all it takes is, you know, the miracle of just moving, walking, you know, if you can. Using the stairs, just, you know, walking somewhere instead of driving. Years ago, I worked with uh, Dr. Uh, Mim Nelson at, at Tufts, who I'm sure you know. Oh, I know her. She's, yeah, she's she's magnificent. A, yeah. She's something. And the whole strong woman, strong bones thing where women who had never, ever lifted weights, never gone into a gym in their life, never put on a pair of spandex, they started a light weight training program in increased bone density at starting at 60. So it's never too late. You know, never and, too late. That's yeah. one of the 10, 10 points there. You know, it's that's really the truth. Uh, we can get fearful, as you said earlier. We can uh, accept the uh, the stereotype that uh, as we get old, I'm too old for that, or that's you know, I can't do that. And maybe you can't, but you can do something, or maybe a, a portion of it. And uh, if again, we're we can be our worst enemies, uh, and it's understandable because of the the culture of the world and the the uh, the unstated uh, ageism that w- has been there, but realize that that's bunk. That is no longer true, and it's and just just get up off the sofa, start moving, a few steps a day, and when you're doing that regularly, do a few more, and then a few more. This is the Kitesen approach: little steps. Because if you try to take on too much too soon, it it's pro- it's not going to work. Our brain is not wired to do make big changes. Uh, we inherited that. So little changes, those are good and uh, you can do it. You become confident and the change is durable. Yep. I think that's really important. I know that you can't have a, a universal application of the 10 tips because each person is different. But if our listeners are saying, okay, where should I start? In what arena should I focus? Have you, in your experience, would you be able to identify what you feel are the most enduring changes if you wanted to focus on, let's say, three out of the 10? Yes. Uh, it's it's all in context. Uh, you know, it, um, Kathleen, it's a, uh, I've seen it change. Uh, there was a time when I said that absolutely movement is the most important thing. And then I said social connection. But these days, uh, oddly enough, the the tip that deals with this said, wherever you are, be there. And that is about being present. That is about being mindful. That is about uh, being in your life, and which remarkably reduces stress. Stress is related to about 80% of our medical visits. Wow. 80% stress. We're living in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a world that we have created that is markedly different from our hunter gatherers. And we're not really wired for that stress. I mean, we're doing it and we have to, but we have to, um, to, to, to shut that down, reboot it. Is it, if it's meditation or if it's, uh, it's just uh, reading a book or it's being with a pet or it's walking in nature or doing yoga, something that will just stop our chattering mind, even for seconds to reboot it so that otherwise it gets out of control. So I consider that now in, where I am in life and probably for all ages being mindful. I still think that uh, so being socially connected uh, is very important and having purpose, particularly as we age. Young people don't think so much about purpose that that's all surrounds them with their family and job. But as you become older, a purpose is a, is huge. And to the extent you don't have one when you're older, a reason to get out of bed, uh, you probably won't be able to get out of bed here pretty shortly in movement. So I, that's really four. But if you consider, you know, um, you know, where you are in the context. So being mindful and present, I think, is critical. Uh, it manages stress. It, it's quality of life. And all the other things are, are, are improved by it. But being connected, we're, we're social creatures, having purpose, huge. And if we don't move, we can't do half the things that we really want to do. That's wonderful. And it's surprising to me. I didn't think you would start with being present. And believe me, I need that. I, <laughs> I need that. Uh, and so many people need that because we're not in the moment because we're worrying about the next moment and the moment after that, the moment after that. And 
it's, You're right. we're, it's... we're creating an environment where we're more uh, likely to have uh, d- disease. Uh, we're having poor quality of life. We're having poor social relations. Uh, all of the things that are important are affected by by not being uh, in your life, not being present and not having emotional intelligence, you can call it, uh, all of these things. Uh, we're rushing through and, uh, you know, have you ever driven maybe five, 10 miles and not remember a thing that you- Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, how did I get here? And, there is and a word for life. that. I don't know what it is, but there is a word for- When you're driving, especially if you're commuting, and I'm sure my listeners have had this experience, you're driving the same road, same day, and all of a sudden you realize you're at this exit and you don't remember passing anything. Yeah, and there's no, it's not a disease. Well, you could call it a disease of of, of modern life, but life is a series of moments. You miss those moments, you miss your life. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, very profound. Very profound. And and the purpose, what the Japanese call ikigai, the reason to yes, reason to get up in the morning. And one thing, our world has such need for people. Our nonprofits, our uh, communities, our young people have need for who you are and what you've lived. And to feel that you don't have purpose is is very destructive and you're robbing the world from the gift of who you are. Very so. true. Well, well said. Now, you know, purpose is defined by you. It can be just raising roses, you know, mm-hmm. or trying to make the world beautiful or, or whatever. But um, usually it involves other living things, you know, humans or animals or, you know, the planet even. And, uh, it's something to get you out of bed, but it's something that uh, that that gives your life meaning. And uh, there's a there's a gentleman. I, he just passed actually. He was the oldest man in Australia, and uh, he got up every day to knit sweaters for penguins. Oh my gosh! Flashy sweater. <laughs> so the penguins had been subjected to oil spills, and they would preen their feathers and ingest the oil and die. But with these sweaters, they couldn't do that, and they really look cool. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, Alfie Date was his name, and uh, he lived to be 108. And oh uh, that was gosh. his purpose. And and uh, you know, Stomatis Moritis was a Greek freedom fighter, and uh, he uh, was sent to the U.S. in World War II. He was sent to the U.S. to heal, and he stayed, and he had a whole life. And then he had a diagnosis of lung cancer, and they said, you're going to die within a year. So he went back to the Greek island where he was born, and he saw his friends there and, and met them. And, and he started feeling good, and he started uh, a vineyard, and he worked in his friend's olive branch. Garden. Olive. Garden or olive yeah. Uh, Grove. Olive Grove. Grove. That's it, Grove. And uh, he he lived to be uh, 104, uh, and he was supposed to die at 69. Oh, and, my gosh. Uh, someone asked him, what does your doctor think? He says, I don't know. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. And he probably had the, uh, what is the Greek liqueur? Um, uh, ooh, not Osaka, but there's some very powerful Greek liqueur that he's probably had that every Uzo. night yeah yeah Uzo, yeah. Uzo yeah. yeah he was yeah. having that with his friends <laughs> in fact he said that someone says what is it that lets you to have such a long life he says it's the wine i drink it with my friends yeah and the latter part is really uh th- th- i usually use that for the social connection part but it's a purpose uh if you know it's uh it's who we are as humans you know without purpose and in, in our brains we don't do well yeah, you know, you're exactly right. Um, you've gone on to create Masterpiece, which is this phenomenal series of programs that are created and, and delivered to people who are fortunate enough to live in communities like continuing care, retirement communities. But what would your recommendation be for the vast majority of older adults who are living alone? or with their spouse, what should they do to ensure a long and healthy life? Well, uh, if they have the possibility to, to take uh, the, uh, you know, the lifestyle inventory or anything that uh, sort of gives an objective view of their lifestyle to help them, 
and realize that any changes they're going to make, as we've said, have to be small changes in order to be successful, in order to be durable. But I think the the four core things that we uh, have talked about and uh, are in the book uh, is c- move, continue to move. That's that's not a hard thing. And if you're a couch, but I had a I had a patient who was a heart attack ready to happen, and uh, he had you know he had diabetes, he had prediabetes, he was overweight, he had high blood pressure, you know, high cholesterol, all of it. And uh, we, he would have some success and then he would recidivate and go back like most of us. And so mm-hmm. uh, writing this book and finding, finding out about Kitesen, I said, look, I only want you to stand during commercials for the next week. He says, that's it. I said, yeah, that's it. He comes back. He's all puffed up because he did it. And then I said, now I want you to walk in place. And he comes back all puffed up because he could do that. And then let's go out and walk 100 steps, okay, more than what you would do. And so over a year, he, he all of his meds went away, he lost 50 oh, pounds, you know, and nothing dramatic. It was, and then he, he he's got positive feedback. You look great and he felt good. And so that was a positive incentive. And so whatever you do, doing small steps, but, you know, it's about moving. It's about staying socially connected. We tend to lose connections as we age. Uh, you know, we have through work and and career and uh, people move and and if we lose a spouse, we're in very, very. Yeah, if we, we stop driving at night, our world gets smaller. And uh, we've talked about purpose. You have to have purpose and meaning and uh, and to, to continue to use your brain with like neoplasticity is as long as you continue to learn new things, you don't have to become a master of it. Just try something new, uh, you know, get out of your comfort zone, get lost every now and then. GPS will, will take care of it. Uh, reach out to someone you might be a little afraid of or reach out to people who've been lost, you know, into your life. Now we can do it with uh, the Internet. And so so it's just continuing to grow in small steps. And anyone can do that. Uh, it's It's, you know, we tend to get put off because we're hit with these uh these very sophisticated and and almost impossible like physical programs to do intellectual programs to do and we get we try it we get tired of it and we quit the things we're talking about are, are not difficult and they make you feel better so you tend to do them just just move a little more stay connected or even grow your connections Use your brain, learn, learn some new things, however small, one word a day, or, or you can do a big thing. And we can see changes in the brain scans with people who are, say, learning an instrument or a language. It's getting thicker in that area. It's growing new, new brain connections. But anything small can do. Uh, get out of your routine. You know, guys, when you shave, start on the other side of your face instead of that. Putting on makeup, start on the other side than what you do. When you shower, we all have a routine. Yeah. Get up a little bit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's not hard, but it's very good for our health, our brain function, and, and overall uh, approach. I, I, to I think that's terrific. Uh, and I would say have, have fun failing. Like try knitting and fail at knitting, try bocce or tennis or pickleball and, and just lower right. your expectations and go out and have fun and move and, and learn and be a little stress-free because you're not making a career out of knitting or bocce or, or pickleball. So, yeah, you know, we all, we take it too seriously and we feel we have to be good at it and all of that. So those are excellent, ex- it's excellent advice, Kathleen. Listen to Kathleen. <laughs> this has been fabulous. I have loved talking to you. You like, walk the talk and you've and 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 you're just very real. You've given our listeners a lot to think about and a and a really, really easy way to change their lives. That's very um, kind of you. Thank you. And I wrote the book with that in mind too, with that kind of tone that that it's easy to read and that you don't have to be afraid and it doesn't matter how many letters I have to have to my name. I put up my pants the same way. I have a pulse. We can do this together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you're incredibly accessible for someone with your experience and background and, and knowledge. And I think that's wonderful. 
So I want to get to know you a little bit better. We know you're an icon of healthy aging and an inspiration to many, including me. Um, But share with us what your favorite guilty pleasure is. Guilty pleasure? Well, for one thing, Kathleen, I'm at a point in my life where I'm not guilty about anything. (laughs) (laughs) Yay! Okay, so you're not Irish Catholic. (laughs) I just came back from a uh, a long trip in Portugal and the uh, guilty pleasure was their pastries, you know. I don't normally eat pastries and I don't find anything wrong with it, but, you know, I'm just not drawn to it. But theirs were excellent. So, uh, you know, again, I wasn't guilty about it. And uh, I, I think that life is worth life isn't worth living without chocolate or, uh, you know, ice cream. And but you have to do it in moderation. So don't feel guilty about something, but just do it in moderation. But anyway, uh Guilty pleasures for me are, are in context. In Portugal, it was pastries. Wow. Uh, that is next on my bucket list is Portugal, the Azores in Portugal. So I will make a note of that. Highly um, recommend. What is, of all the things that you do that are healthy, what's your favorite healthy practice? You know, you're going to be surprised by this one too, but it's related to the the, the best tip that I did. And that is drawing. During COVID, when I couldn't travel anymore, I I took to drawing, and uh, it made me very present. It made me, it shut down my chattering mind. It um, uh, it. Was this the put, first time? Had have you ever drawn as you were younger? Little, little bit, hardly anything at all. Uh, and and it was uh, it was something that made me content, happy, even joyful, uh, wow. and good or not, you know, it was. Uh, it, and so I recommend, as we said, something that shuts your mind down for your chattering mind mm. and be present. It is so fulfilling and it energizes you in a way where you can go out and do all the other things that are that are healthy. But if, again, if you if if your mind is somewhere else or even as you're exercising, you're thinking about the guy who can do more than you or or what you have to do today, all the things. And so I got to get this done. You know, that's. Um, you lose the benefit, a lot of the benefit of that. So drawing. Okay. Nice. Continue to do it. It's a magnificent way to, to be present. Wow. That's a really good idea. I like to say my mind is a bad neighborhood that I don't want to spend a lot of time in. <laughs> You're not alone, Kathleen. It's inevitable with all of us. We can never be always present. But like I said, just grab moments, you know, schedule a moment where you can be, do something that you feel it when it happens. Yeah. Oh yeah. Nature, walking, being with a pet, you know, meditating is made for this, but you know, some people find that difficult, but it shouldn't be. But anyway, anything that, uh, why it's that, that mind, it's, uh, it's, it's a blessing. Our brain, but it's also a curse. That is the truth. What is guaranteed Dr. Landry to make you laugh? Uh, that has to be with my grandkids, you know, they, they're getting older, but you're still seeing them interact with each other and with their pet dog. Uh, it just, it's just, you know, it, it isn't always a belly laugh, but it's always joyful. And, but they do make me laugh quite a mm. bit. So uh, there's something about, uh, grandkids and, and there's something about children in general. That's why it's one of the 10 tips. Um, you know, thus the FK said the, the soul is healed by being with children. Mm-hmm. And indeed, it's true. And uh, I have found it to be true. So that's a consistent one. Yeah. I, I, laughing at myself is the other thing. <laughs> that I is find a lot of humor. That's very good. You need to that. I think we all need that. Um, you read, I'm sure, tons of medical journals and 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 other intellectual pursuits. What's the last book you love? Well, both were novels, and I don't read get to read novels too often, and uh, I love it when I do. And, and I'm, I'm going to give you two. So one is Nightingale. Uh, that By Kristen Hanna. Yes, Kristen Yeah, Hanna, excellent. Writer, uh, World War II, and I'm interested in, uh, you know, military war fiction and uh, war-related fiction, like Winds of War and that sort of thing. And uh, another one was The Measure. And uh, I can't remember that. It's a young female author, but... This is a very provocative uh, book in the sense of how it makes you think. Uh, and it, it's, well, you, as you may know, it's basically 
what would happen if we knew how long we had to live? Would we want to know? And if we did know, how would that change us and how would it change culture? And it's it's a novel. So it's not a you know, it's not a it's not a nonfiction book that talks about this. So uh, so it's presented in a very, uh, very interesting, creative way. Yeah, I, it's on my nightstand. Uh, I have not cracked it open yet, but I love the premise. I love the premise where everyone has a piece of string. String, yeah. And that is the your lifespan. So, so that, that's box, all I know. But The uh, box comes, not everybody opens the box. They don't want to know how long they have to live. And some open it, and then what happens when you see a long string? And what happens if your spouse has a short string or, you know, some and and how it changes dynamics and how it might lead to prejudice and every it's very, it's very, uh, very creative. Uh, it sounds excellent. Thank you. Good recommendations. <laughs> um, and you talked about going to Portugal. What is your favorite escape? Escape? Uh, well, I would I would say it's road trips. Uh, they I think I've driven across the country with my wife. Uh, I don't know, maybe I think last count was 23 times across the country. Every wow. time an adventure. This was a road trip in Portugal that we just took for three, for three weeks. And uh, it was fascinating. It was challenging uh, in a positive way. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes tell people to scare themselves, you know, to get out of their mm-hmm. comfort zone. And uh, some people, that would scare them. It, you know, I lived in Europe quite a bit, so it's not as scary for me, but it still is challenging yourself in a way you don't speak the language, although most speak English. And uh, but the weather was great and uh, it was a road trip in uh, Port. So I love road trips. Uh, it used to be that meant I couldn't be reached, you know, because oh, yeah. you were away. And so you were you were there. But, you know, now you can be reached. But uh, but you're still uh, in a in escape. It's truly an escape. So. Yeah, because you're and that's also another principle of yours, but you're focusing. So if you're on a road trip in a foreign country and you, the roadsides are not familiar, you're really focusing on the task at hand. You're not going to absolutely forget what you're doing. <laughs> and we found a very one. There was one time talk about scaring yourself. We uh, we went to Greece for um, I think it was two weeks and we made no plans whatsoever except the first night in athens so we flew to athens had a hotel that night after that we had nothing planned nothing and so it was scary that is scary (laughs) and i'll tell you it was the most memorable trip we have ever had in a Uh. positive way you know not everything was efficient and but it was so it was amazing what would happen we'd land on a greek island have no place to stay and it would work out. Someone would walk up. Would you like to stay in my house? You know, because <sighs> and you know, let's let's look at it, and it would work oh out. Oh my gosh, that talk about stuff. It, off the beaten path. It restored your faith in humans, in human nature, and uh, the world, and uh, uh, it was it was remarkable. We don't do that so much anymore. We made plans for Portugal, but not not you know, we were on our own and on a road trip. So uh, it was uh, remarkable. Oh, that sounds fantastic. And you know, if that scares you're still someone, married. <laughs> <laughs> that could scare a lot of people. You don't have to do that. But, you know, get out of your comfort zone, though, you know, at least a little bit. Yeah. And that also helps your brain, helps you being present. True enough. Wonderful, wonderful advice. Well, thank you so much. This has been a true gift to have you on the program. Kathleen, you're a, you're a pro and uh, really great questions and uh, very warm hospitality. I so appreciated it. And thanks for what you do. Oh, thank you. That's our show for today. If you enjoyed it, please tell your friends about us so we can reach more minds. Give us a rating and review on Apple Podcast and send me your questions on aging. Until next time, enjoy the chance to get smarter about growing older. <laughs>